gonna do this this tune, this boy I wrote, man. Let me see. It's quiet now by Denny Zeitlin. Denny's quiet now. I'm going to be seeing <laughs> yeah. Denny in a couple of days. What a, what a touching tribute to Denny Zeitlin. Oh, man. he Well, actually, this stone he wrote is in 4 4, and I'm playing it as a waltz. Folks, yeah. welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. <laughs> and uh, we are here in Oakland uh, and graced by the presence of a brilliant musician and uh, amazing human being, guy I've, who's been a big, big supporter of mine since the beginning of the Jake Feinberg Show. Calvin Keyes, cheers to you, brother. Right on, Jake. It's good to see you here in the Bay Area, man, and it's a beautiful, sunshiny day. The rain's coming later. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's been cold rain and snow so far throughout the day. You know, Bill, uh, Bill Rich is tuning in, and I just I wanted you to talk, speak to the people out there about, you know, I was talking about, uh, you know, uh, Tulsa had a, had a, had a hotbed, of mu- was a hotbed of music activity, but Omaha was as well, and I just wanted you to talk to the peeps out there about the brotherhood that exists in Oma, from Omaha. Omaha, Nebraska, yeah, we had quite a few musicians. And uh, as a matter of fact, I just got back from doing a concert at the Holland Center. 
in uh, last month, and it was Kate was one of the sponsors. She she has a club called Hi Fi, beautiful concert hall. But what she's doing, she's merging with the Hi Fi to the Holland Center because it's a bigger budget, you know, more pres prestige. And what she's doing, she's doing a documentary of the musicians who's left that came out of the near north side, Omaha, Nebraska, which I'm fortunate enough to be one of them. And then Curly Martin. Then it was Henry Red who worked with Stevie Wonder for about 11 years. And then uh, Harold Hunter, Stems in Skeets Hunter, who had the Olive Branch records I recorded for. And uh, Wally Ali, who was another guitar player that lived Wally there. is a dear friend of the Jake Feinberg show. Yeah, he's lived yeah. down in Los Angeles. What about Ronnie Beck? Well, Ronnie wasn't there at this particular... Uh, uh, this uh, junction. Yeah. Junction here. But, you know, quite naturally, Ronnie's well-known, too. As a matter of fact, he did Jazz on the Green earlier this year, last year, and uh, did a tribute to his mother, uh, Jean Rogers, who was one of my prolific musical instructors is because of her is the reason why I'm playing music today. And they he and him and his brother and his sister Carolyn did a special ballad in her honor in which I had I pulled my pistol out and made him let me play on it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm trying to think of it. But anyway it was a beautiful, a beautiful uh afternoon. But then getting back to what we're doing now, what Kate is doing, and you know, and Curly and myself, I guess we're the last two standing musicians other than Ronnie and the guys who's out here in California that goes back and still do concerts and things. And so we did this concert at the Holland Center on February the 2nd. <clears throat> and the Mason Prince, who was a very well-known trumpeter out of Omaha, he made his transition, I think, that week. I had just, I had just talked to him. He had just got out of the hospital. And so he was another one of the gurus, one of the music professors that we learned from. And uh, Terrence Martin, who was Curly's son, who was one of the top producers now in Los Angeles, he did the, uh, 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 the album that won that boy, them five Grammys of. Uh, what was his name? Uh, Lamar Kendricks. And they won another four this year. So he was there in Omaha playing his alto. Kendrick Lamar. Yeah, Ken Kendrick Lamar. And so Lamar Kendricks did. <laughs> no, I, I did. I did. So, that, so you, you were out there. Tell me, tell me about um, this. Um, this has been fascinating me for a long time. When you, when you played with Ray Charles... Did you play, play mostly rhythm guitar? Well, I played guitar with Ray Charles, and it wasn't about no rhythm. It was about playing the guitar because he liked the blues. What I'm, what I'm getting at is the rudiments of the fact that the guitar was a rhythm instrument for a long time before it became a lead instrument. Now, yeah, but Charlie Christen broke, stopped all that. He broke all that shit up. He started soloing like horns, and he said, I want to play this instrument just like a saxophone player, and that's with Benny Goodman. That's, so that's when he started soloing. But when I played with Ray, I was part of the band, the 19-piece band that he had. And I would play cards, and I would solo through the band, too. I mean, you know, hey, I was another instrument. And and, and the reason why I worked with Ray off and on so long, you know, when he got in trouble with guitar players, he would call me because he knew I was going to bail him out because I played the blues for Ray. Now, hold on. For the, for the peeps that are watching worldwide, keep the comments coming in. Uh, people have have not seen Calvin in a long time. Some people are chiming in here. Okay, it when he was having a problem, it was because some a guitar player was wanking it, right? He was going off and doing all this. Oh yeah. So, I mean, but I mean, he the blues. What is the blues to, to Ray Charles? Hey, Ray Charles was the blues. And listen to them earlier records that he did. When I joined, when I moved to LA in '69. I had brought me a brand new Buick in Kansas City because I knew I was going to need it to get around in that big city and make all the gigs. I put 100,000 miles on the car in two years going to different gigs. And so <clears throat> what I didn't know then, any African-American musician coming to L.A. 
had to go through the Ray Charles band. That was like an initi- initiation. Absolutely. Piece, which I didn't know that at the time. Mm-hmm. And the word was out, you know, there's new guitar players in town from Kansas City, Calvin, he can play, and he just, and this and that and other. And so I ended up going down meeting Ray, and I did a few recording sessions with him. And so one morning he called me and he said, Calvin, I said, yeah. He said, I got a problem. I said, well, what's up, R.C.? <laughs> See, we got to the point I could call him R.C., that's Ray Charles. And he says, well, my guitar player just quit on me, and I got to go to Europe for six weeks. He said, well, could I influence you to go with me? And I said, whoa, to Europe? And I ain't never been to Tijuana. (laughs) (laughs) So so we talked, and I said, okay, Ray, I think... I think we might have come up on so we, so we talked up on the deal and the contract and everything and I said okay I do it and so this was like Saturday and just before he hung up I said well wait Ray you know what I got one more problem that I haven't spoke with you about he said what's that I said I don't have a passport he said really I said no he said you ever been busted for anything I said no he said well be down in my office Monday morning at eight o'clock. I said, okay, over on Washington. So I went down, 8 o'clock, 6 o'clock Monday night, I had a passport in Italy to meet him. That's how fast he worked. He got me a passport in eight hours. And that was the beginning of our relationship. Um, can you talk about the idea of playing guitar in Ray Charles's band? How, how you w- would be able to sort of move back and forth between holding it down and also being able to play melodies. Well, he had his charts. He had charts for the band. You could read flypaper. Yeah, I, I couldn't read no flypaper. I knew my car changes enough to, to, to get through all the tunes and stuff. And then I would practice and, you know, and then and, 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 uh, the piano player that was with him was uh, the brother out of Texas, uh, James. Jim? Oh, man, what was his name? He wrote a few arrangements to him. But the, the James Polk. And so James would help me with the cards and everything. And all the guys would help me. You know, I wasn't no hell of a reader or nothing. As a matter of fact, I used to play by ear. And that was one of the points of me learning how to read to get time music and playing with Ray. I had a chance to do that. And so it was more than just a gig. You know, it was a learning process, procedure. Ray used to see us, and, and I was set back on his right behind him with the band. And he used to turn around to me and say, Calvin, I said, what? He said, turn that up. Don't let that get away. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, he used to make little marks like that. And so, <laughs> uh, you know, we just, it was, it was like I said, it was a, 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 a very exciting experience with, for me just to be able to play that music that he had recorded and was playing with the big band, too, and then five Ray Letts. I mean, hey, man, you know, every, I think every musician should have experienced that. And like I said, he didn't have nothing but his music, and he knew when it was right and when it was wrong. And if you play something wrong, he'd bust you, he'd tell you. He said, all right, that third trumpet in the fifth bar, that's not a B flat, that's an A. <laughs> And I said, how the hell he know all that? But he knew it. You know, he couldn't see him. So he, he knew all the music because of his hearing was so precise. And he knew all the parts and everything. And he knew when you was messing up and making a mistake. And I cut a few hogs, you know. But like I said, that was part of the process of learning, man. And like I said, it was one of the greatest colleges that I have experienced in my life. Right, you can't experience that in academia today. I mean, that that, that was on the bandstand experience. Well, well, if you walked away with, I mean, do you feel like your time, your time feel, I mean, obviously you were, you were, you were breaking bread with Gadsden, you know, and, and, and Frankie Edwards, that was preceded Ray, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. So when, do you feel your, what was the, the best technical or the best musical thing that you walked away with after that experience with Ray Charles? Well, it was part of my musical upbringing. And like I said, I was fortunate enough to have enough going for me for him to want me to come and work with him. And after a while, that became, I, I, that challenge wasn't no more for me. It, I wanted to do something else. 
And what I really wanted to do was get with a piano player. Ahmad. But I had no idea it would be a Maj Mahal. But there, we don't want to skip over. There was a. When did you leave Ray? When I left Ray in 1972. Wow, right there into. 73. And I joined Ahmad in 74. But see, prior to Ray, I was in Denver with Frank Edwards. And. You know, that was a group that James Gatson and I broke bread together, the organ player. And Ahmad was at a club called... Charles the, Kennard. Uh, yeah, that was part of it. Charles wouldn't even let me on the bandstand. Charles wouldn't even let you on the bandstand. No, I didn't know what I was doing then. But anyway, that you know, that was something that let, came into play later. <coughs> but anyway, <coughs> Ahmad was working at this club called the Red Embers in Denver. And so I walked in and asked him, could I sit in with him? And he said, no, young man, I have a closed set. I'm sorry. I said, okay. But 10 years later, he calls me in L.A. looking for a guitar player. And the reason why he called me is because Charles Owen knew Ahmad, and they were very close. And he said, well, he said, Ahmad, you're looking for a guitar player. He said, well, there's one guitar player I think you need to know about, and that's Calvin Keyes. And he gave him a number, and so he called me. I'm in the pool hall. And he called me two, three <laughs> times, and my old lady called me and said, Calvin Martin called here three times. He's opening at the trooper door tonight, and he wanted to see if you could open with him. I said, really? So I rushed home, and I called him, and I said, okay, Mr. Jamal, I'll be there at 9 o'clock. So I took a shower and got shower and went on up to the trooper door. And I walked in, and he went to do cheap introduced each other. Uh, we introduced ourselves to each other. And so we went up in his dressing room and he pulled out some charts and started going over some of his music. And I knew most of his music. And he looked at me and he said, Calvin, do you read that well? I said, not really. And I said, being honest, I said, Ahmad, I'm from a family of 14. I was the first grandchild. I had eight uncles and six aunts. And on the weekends, they would play your music very religiously on the weekends and party. So I knew all of your music and I knew all your tunes and so I had figured out a lot of it. And he said, wow, that's incredible. So we did the two weeks and uh, exactly, it, and you know, it was another group there called Hodges, James, and Smith. I never will forget a vocal group, a trio. And uh, so... It was like R&B kind of thing? Well, you know, kind of pop of, of, of Supremes type of situation, you know. And so we went on and did the two weeks, and it was incredible. And so he said, Cal, he said, I'm going to see if I can't get to the point where I can, you know, call you and hire you. I said, oh, beautiful, okay. And so for the next three or four months, he would call me once a week and uh, ask me what I was doing and, you know, keep in contact with me, keep in touch with me. And so I got to the point where I said, well, Amon, I said, you know, I'm going to have to get me a gig. I need to work. So I might have to go back out with R.C., you know. He said, oh, really? I said, yeah. It's a couple of weeks later, he called me and said, Cal, there's a ticket for you at United Airlines to New York. And he said, you come on. He said, if I don't pick you up, I have somebody to pick you up. And that was the beginning of our relationship. And that was in 1974. And I went through a whole transition because me and the girl I was with broke up. And I had and I, and I just left L.A. And I knew where I was going. I was coming to the Bay Area because the first time I came to the Bay Area was in 1961. And that's when Fillmore was all black and I've never recovered. That's the reason why I'm here today because the music scene was so strong up here. And... Uh, you know, that's where I am today. I'm here now. So it's a, uh, it's I'm celebrating my birthday and I, I happy birthday to you. Yeah, cheers to you, brother. And uh, I, I would just as we're, I wanted you to play something uh, for, a, uh, in tribute to John Coltrane. Whatever you, whatever comes to mind. Okay. I'm that's my, that's, that's my that's my wish. All right.
name of that? <laughs> Naima. Cheers, man. Beautiful. Yeah, Happy that, birthday. Yeah, that baby. That that. One of the most beautiful. I'm sorry. I was just. I I, 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 I I couldn't even. I Naima couldn't even. for that beautiful wife he had. Um, do you remember uh, trying to put your ear to Love Supreme and how long it took you to <coughs> work it out? Well, I never learned Love Supreme. It was a motive. All I remember was a Love Supreme. Love Supreme, right. The, but and the, so he, I think John had went, he had found his calling and, you know, the spirit had taken over. Exactly. And, you know, and like I said, it's, it happens. Can you, your grand, your, you have black, uh, Blackfoot, uh, uh, Native American. Yeah, it, you, which which type of which Native American blood do you have in you? And did you experience some spiritual uh, uh, Native American uh, music? Awakenings. Well, I mean, the spirit. You talk about the spirit. McLaughlin did try to. He learned. It took him a year to learn Love Supreme, mm -hmm. and he said at that point John had given himself up to the light, to whatever God, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. uh, but he had, he, to a, he had, you said the spirit. And the spirit yes, ran deep well, with your grandmother. And, and and that's, can you talk about that spirit? Well, that, my grandmother was, my great-grandmother, my father's grandmother, Miss Smith, she was Blackfoot Indian. And I remember coming home from high school in Omaha, I used to stop by her house and I brushed her hair a hundred strokes. She was about four foot two. She was real sharp, but her hair was all the way down to her ankle. Long hair, right? Yeah. I would brush her hair a hundred strokes and she would give me two quarters, 50 cents, which gas was like 12 cents a gallon then, 17 cents a gallon. She gave me enough money to buy me three or four gallons worth of gas back and forth to school. And uh, we used to go fishing with her youngest daughter, who was my Aunt Lovey. I wrote a song about her. I know that too well. Well, she, we used to go up this little creek northeast, west of Omaha, called Salt Creek, between Omaha and Lincoln. We used to go on Fridays, her and her boyfriend, Johnny. Trembling Johnny, that's what we called him because he would shake. Trembling know, Johnny. And he was in Blackfoot. And so we would go up there Friday and fish till Sunday night and go back Monday morning with truck, truck loads of fish. And that's one thing we used to do pretty much every weekend. They liked their Morgan David wine. And we make dough ball and corn and fish and they fried chicken up and everything. Hey man, that was the ritual for the weekend. What kind of wine? Mogan David. Wow. <laughs> some right good wine. But if they got some good whiskey, it might have killed them. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what they drink. They oh, like Mogan David wine because it was sweet, man. But like I said, that's what I rem would remember. Sure. And uh, But I don't think she ever got to the point where she had actually heard me play guitar. I think she kind of, I think they had made their transition before I really got into the guitar. My dad, mom's grandma, Tex, I think she used to hear me practice. Because, see, my dad was a drummer. He was a very excellent drummer, too, but... Just on the side? He was probably... No, the... he wanted to become a professional drummer, but his mother, my grandmother, Tex, and my mother, Mrs. Ruby, Keys thought all musicians were bad news. You know, dope addicts, drug addicts, womanizers, pimps, gamblers. So he didn't have a chance. And I think I inherited that musical germ that he had. He must have passed it on to me. See, because he wouldn't, you know, he there wasn't no way he could. I think to his claim to fame, he the Carolina Cotton Pickers came through Omaha and he got a chance to work with them maybe two or three nights. But him and Preston Love grew up together. Mm -hmm. You know, Preston was, had the big band and I worked with Preston and I think he worked with Preston when Preston got started, but he really wasn't able to pursue his talent as a drummer. And I, that's why I think he passed that germ on to me. And like I said, I 
had no idea I would become a professional musician. And I remember when I left Omaha in 1969 to move to California. My dad asked me, he said, Calvin, he said, why are you going to California? I said, well, Dad, I'm going to go see if I can get me a recording contract. I'm going to record some music, you know. And he said, really? He said, well, why don't you just stay home with me? And I said, no, I'm still in pursuit. I'm still searching. I'm searching for that note. He said, well, you can't get no better. I said, Daddy, I'm just touching the surface. <laughs> I ain't even touched the surface yet. And so I went back to Omaha in 1973, I think. And I went and got him. And I was down at the showcase. And I went and got him. I set him down front. And I played to him all night. He couldn't do nothing but shake his head and sit there and cry all night long. And I said, you remember when you asked me why I was moving to California? I said, this is partly because, you know, I've taken a step, but it's just one step of many. And I said, I'm still scratching the surface. I ain't got to where I want to get to. And he said, well, ain't nothing I can say. He said, you got to be one of the greatest guitar players on the planet. I said, dad, I'm just one of many. And I said, I'm still searching for that note. D who was, uh, can you talk about opening for Red Fox and Richard Pryor? And who was, I mean, that was part of the, the gig, man. I mean, before the burning music came on, you'd have that comedy act. But, I mean, McLaughlin said he was falling out of his chair. They made him, they made Pryor stop. He was so funny, you know. Well, he was, you know, Red Fox had a club on La Sienica Boulevard. And I used to work with Gildo Mahones over there. Dude, I, I cannot believe you just name dropped Gildo. I came to see him. <laughs> he lives right here. Well, Gildo and, and Henry Franklin, I think, and Iambo, and uh, whoever else was. I'm vaguely remembering, because like I said, I used to play all gigs. I'd take every gig that I could. You guys were starving to death. Gadsden was starving to death. Hey, Carnard gave him a record date. And so... Uh, I worked at the Tiki Island. That's where Charles Kennard was a house band there. And see, when I was in Kansas City, Charles was working at the Blue Room down on 18th and Vine in the Streets Hotel. And I, would, I went in there and tried to set in with him, and he said, oh, no, 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 no. He ain't ready. You know, because I was playing with Frank, and we were playing basically the blues and stuff. And so he egged me, so I said, okay, that's all right. I walked into the Tiki Island one night, and Charles Kennard said, Calvin Keys? I said, yeah. The guitar player that was with him, he fired him and hired me on the spot, which I didn't like, but I needed a gig, so I took the gig for about two weeks. And after that, I said, you know what, Charles, I, I, I'm going to have to cut this loose because I got something else I'm, I'm going to do. I think I went to Vegas with Demeter Joe uh, Red Heels or something. <coughs> but Red, I ended up Red, Red Fo there. Fox had a club, and then he would, would he perform nightly at that club? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was his supper club. You know, he was a famous comedian. So he had a club like all the rest of the big time comedians and artists and actors get their own places. And Richard was doing the intermissions. At Red Fox's joint? Yeah. That and, is and fantastic. He was, and he was like, you know, Red was one of his gurus. I mean, he was, you know, Red influenced quite a few. Because he wasn't no joke himself. He was incredible, man. There was another brother in there called the Brown Fox. What was his name? He worked at the freezing room and all the rest of the club. So, I mean, them cats had a certain, you know, man, Tan Morland and, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, what was it? Oh, man, uh, Leroy and Skillet. I'm talking about some real comedian, man, that would give you a hernia <laughs> if you get to laugh. What, what about the cat um, uh, Holmes, the astrologer, DJ, cat radio DJ, too? Oh, Rick Holmes. Yeah, did the you did, did, he, did he bring you down to, to play? Because he used to have a, a, yeah, a radio gig Rick down. Holmes, Rick Holmes was a very good friend of mine. Man, and he used to play all our music, man, black jazz records and stuff. That's yeah, when Gene, we, you know, that's when black jazz records hit the scene, and all them brothers were proud of that label, and they would play all that music, man. Larry, Larry Gales had just moved to Los Angeles from New York, and he had been working with Thelonious Spear Monk, and he opened up a coffee shop, 
in uh, over on over in the Lamert Park area off of Crenshaw, and we used to go there every night, and it didn't start happening until one or two o'clock in the morning, because all of the musicians would go there and hang out and play. And Titty Boom, that's what we call Larry Gales, and he said kids. I said yeah. He said this is the way Monk taught me around midnight. And showed me the correct changes. And then sang it. <laughs> you sung it. Wow. You know, I said, wow. And so, you know, we were just learning. We were just learning. We didn't, you know, I knew about Monk, but, you know, I never got a chance to play with him. I would have jumped at a chance to play with Thelonious, but, you know, this was just California. So, hey, man, any kind of op music opportunity that was available I would jump at it. I went out to Sun and Cher's house to audition for a gig. Uh, uh, like, a, like a tour? Out, or? To their pa out to their mansion. And it was so foul, I said, no, I don't want this. I ain't going into detail, but, you know, I don't want to no get high. I don't want no drugs. I want some music and <laughs> shit. So, you know, I mean, we just had, that was part of it. That was the reason why I moved to California was to get into the music scene and when Gene asked me, did I want to do a record for this new label he's getting ready to start, Black Jazz Records, I said, finally, yes. And we went in the studio and got to work. <laughs> yeah, the engineer, Ron Steele's tuning in. He said, nice playing. You know, uh, we wasn't them babies. We were babies then, man. Uh, right. Like said, and it wasn't, you know, it was, it was, I was just going to say, um, have you played Aunt Lovey in a while? I, 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 I that, you know, love I re recorded it on, on, on Wide Hide Records. We get, uh, Gregory Howell had a, the uh, trombone player write an arrangement on it, and I redid it. But, you know, like I said, you know, when Ray was, I was in Ray, Oliver Nelson come in doing a producing a record session, and then he'd get drank a little more than he was supposed to, and he Fall out on the couch. Oliver would. Oliver Nelson. And you know, uh, we take a break, the lunch break, and come back in. And the dude said, Calvin, you know, the dude said, Ray, Oliver's drunk. He's on the couch. He said, Really? He said, All right, put a blanket over him. We'll finish tomorrow. <laughs> but you know, I, you know, hey, man. I, <laughs> put a blanket on him. He said, Yeah, cover him up with a blanket and keep him warm, and we'll finish tomorrow. And like I said, you know, I knew. I didn't know who Oliver Nelson was at that time. I mean, he turned out to be one of the baddest <laughs> musicians and producers that ever lived. But, you know, like I said, when you're young and you're around a certain situations, man, it's, 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 you know, it just happened. When I moved to California, no, before I moved to the Bay Area, I was working at Charles Sullivan's Booker T. Washington Hotel. I ran into Norman Williams. With the bishop? The bishop. And I knew Norman in Kansas City. He said, Keys, what days you off? I said, we off on Sundays. He said, I'm going to come get you Sunday. Won't you come hang out with me? I said, cool. He came and got me. He said, I said, where are we going? He said, we're going down to Jazz Workshop. I said, who's down there? He said, dude, Miles Davis. I said, who the fuck is Miles Davis? He said, just come on. I went down to the workshop with him. <clears throat> I'm sitting on the couch next to Cannonball Atlee. Him and Train goes in the back and running over some rhythm changes and Miles walking around gritting and, you know. I had no idea of the company that I was in. You did get backstage, though, and you got to hang with Miles. Well, I mean, I hung out with Bishop, and he was hanging out with the Miles Davis Quintet. I had no idea. Right. You know, I'm just following him because I knew him in Kansas City. So, <clears throat> you know, certain things happen in your life for a reason. And, you know, then then I understood Wes was working at the dad workshop and Miles hit on him or John Coltrane had hit on Wes to play with him. I don't know if it ever happened, but Wes... I understand Wes didn't feel as though he was ready, <laughs> you know, and I said, wow, you know, so, you know, different things happen. Now, King Pleasure, Moody's Mood for Love was one of my best partners, man. He was homeless. Right. You used to used roll to him a joint and take him to breakfast. I used to take him to breakfast every morning and buy him a 50-cent joint. 
Yeah, right. But and the cast was like, who you who was this? I said, Man, this is King Pleasure. And they had no idea what What I was other doing. what other geniuses have you known musically that have died broke? I don't know, man. Uh well I don't know if he died broke or they died broke, but I mean that's an old saying that, you know, certain people like yourselves and other people trying to explain what this music is about say things like that. But Prince didn't die broke. Michael Jackson didn't die broke. Train didn't die broke. West didn't either. So them cats, and Miles didn't either. Them cats made big money, man. So that old cliche about the musicians dying broke is just, that's some bullshit. Because, you know, the cats I know, I might ain't Mingus broke. Died, Mingus died broke. He might have, but what? I don't know if he was broke or not. We don't know. He wasn't stupid. <laughs> no, and he was a genius too. Yeah, he I just, was a genius, but, and but, I think some of that music. But you're naming the, the the you're naming the upper echelon of of the jazz community, Dizzy or Miles or Train. You know, but and uh, uh, what's his boy that was here to the Grateful Dead? Jerry Garcia. He didn't die broke. I mean, you know what I'm uh, saying. Garcia, no, Garcia, he, his hey. estate's doing all right. Hey man, but see, you know, like I said, that old cliche about certain musicians. You come around because of one bad mood. Like I said, you know, I'm sure Charlie Christian's estate gets plenty of money for the royalties and stuff that he wrote music about. And I'm sure that his estate is getting paid. And see, eventually that can't come about because, like I said, you know, certain things happen. Well, we didn't know nothing about the laws and the publishing and all the writers and all the royalties that extend that was available for this music, but as we get older, we learn certain things. Like this gentleman did, I was, when I first moved here, I was doing the history of the blues and jazz in the schools through Concepts, Concepts Cultural Gallery. And I got some information on some, some literature that was written about this record producer called Bob Gettins in West Oakland. And it was written by Lee Hildebrand and some other people. And uh, I was using that to introduce my understanding about the music and the history of it in the school district. So I was at Oakland High one afternoon, and this young lady came up to me and she said, Mr. Keys? I said, yes. She said, well, that man you're talking about, Mr. Geddes? I said, yes. She said, that's my grandfather. Mm. I said, really? She said, yeah. I said, well, take me to him right now. She said, I'm sorry, I can't do that. I said, well, why not? She said, because he died a year ago. My heart dropped to the floor because I wanted to meet him because of what I was reading, it, what they wrote about him and things he did accomplish in the music business and in, in fighting these big labels and stuff. I wanted to talk to him because he knew some things, but I didn't get a chance to meet him. Fortunately, she introduced me to his son and him and I had a very nice long conversation and see Bob he had written over a hundred songs that was recorded and he was fighting with the bigger companies to get his credibility in royalties and stuff and finally the courts ruled in his favor and so Bob Jr. said that they were waiting on a 10 million dollar settlement to the Gettin family. I said beautiful and see Bob was smart enough to copyright all this stuff so we wasn't all stupid, you know, under them circumstances. But like I said, uh, he wrote, he recorded Lowell Fulton, Reconsider Baby. Did you ever, did you ever play with, with Johnny Guitar Watson ever? I knew Johnny very well. You want to talk, because I mean, did, you must have rolled, Johnny was there, you, you were there at that time. And yeah, Johnny was very popular. I never got a chance to play with him, but I knew about him because he does some, he was a hell of a musician. And he was a better piano player than he was a guitar player. A lot player. of people don't know that. I know that. Yeah, that's right. I understand it. You see, like I said, I worked with a partner of mine from Omaha, Nebraska, named Mike Lewis, to work with Johnny and recorded with him. He was a keyboard player. <coughs> he had a group called Mandrake with a helmet that he recorded what? for a Motown. <clears throat> I know that band. Yeah, that was Andre Lewis from Omaha, Nebraska. Oh, man. And his so-called wife down in L.A., Maxine, re recorded Touch for me that I wrote. And she sang it. 
one of the most beautiful versions of it that you've ever heard. So, I mean, there's so much that's not even spoke about, man, going on in this music. Well, it's, it's the people's history. Happened, it's know? the people's history of music on the Jake Feinberg show. And uh, Calvin, before I uh, I let you go, I just I was hoping you could demonstrate your music has been a spiritual compass for me uh, recently, uh, specifically uh, trade winds and, and, and renaissance, just burning, burning music, very um, very old school, um, but very rhythmic. And I, I, I was just hoping you would um, you play some blues for us here. Okay, I got a blues that I, I, I just recorded in this part of the new record that I'm doing called Silver Keys, it's tribute to the late Hard Silver. And my great grandmother, my daddy's grandmother, my great great grandmother, who was an Indian, used to. I'd be out in the yard playing football with Gail and Roger Sayers and them cats, and I bruised my knee and my elbows, and I'd go in, and she would take a silver dollar, tape it on to me. I said, Grandma, what's that about? She said, Well, you know, we Native Americans and we Indians and we know things. And she said, Silver comes from the earth and it will heal anything that's wrong with the human body. I said, Really? She said, Don't ever forget that. And she'd take a silver dollar on me. The next morning, I'd get up and I'm pretty much well. So that was my first positive encounter with silver. And when I get into this music, I ran into another powerful force named Horace Silver. So I decided to do an album in his honor because he was one of the greatest American classical music composers that I know of. And I never met him, but spiritually we were in tune. You call it American classical music? Yes. Better known as jazz. <laughs> But this is a song that I wrote, and it's called Bo Dollar, which is a silver dollar. And I looked it up, and the southerners down there called it a Bo Dollar. B-O. B-O. Bo Dollar. It's spelled different in the dictionary, but it means real. It was a real. B-E-A-U, maybe, yeah. yeah. It wasn't no fake paper. Bo Dollar. dollar. It was a real dollar. <laughs> and so I wrote this tune, and it's a blues. In this, let me see if I can play. Don't forget about the blues.
That's called Bo Dollar. Yeah. Beautiful. It'll be out. You uh, before I let you go, you just peep the uh, let the audience know about what's going on this summer with those younger cats. If you want to talk about that, yes, yeah, a young group called Matson Two. I want to understand they're twins, brothers, and they're out of San Diego. And I got a call from them about a month ago. And uh, I think one of them came and sat in with me here somewhere in Oakland. But then one of the brothers said they ran across the first album that I did with Black Jazz called Shanique. And he said it just, the impact it had on him was incredible. And so he called me and asked me would I be interested in doing some concert touring with him. And I said I'd be honored. And he said, Cal, I got some things already booked. And more things is going to be happening for you, he says. And I, we're a young group, and we got a young following. But when they hear this music that we're going to play from Shawnee, they're going to love it. And you'll be getting a whole new young audience. I said, it sounds good to me. And he said, what we're going to do, we're going to feature Shawnee on all the concerts from cover to cover. And I said, you, was that impressed with that record? He said, the music that y'all are doing is incredible. I said, well, thank you, and I'll be honored to do it with you. So we got some dates coming up. So just look out for them because they're going to be well publicized. Well, thank you. <laughs> and the group is called Matson 2. Calvin Keyes, thank you for your leadership and your love. Uh, continue to stretch the lineage of music. Continue to stretch people's ears and in a live setting. Jeff Comenti uh, from the Dead & Company is indebted to you. He played gigs with you. You've been all over the map. Everyone from Ray Charles to Ahmad Jamal played with everybody. Uh, and uh, much love to you, man. You Thank you, and much love to you and all of your fans and my fans and anybody that's affiliated with this music. And I hope to be able to keep sharing the love with you because that's what this music I play is all about. It's all about the love. You, you told me before, I want you to say it, music is life. Enjoy it. That's right. Music is life. Enjoy. This is the Jake Feinberg Show. We'll see you tomorrow.